which is pointing to cultic rituals around snakes and women. This is not the first time we hear of a conception through a snake in the Greek tradition. There's another reference that I have in my book. My colleague Jana Womack at CIIS has also begun to explore that there's a possible tantric practice somewhere in, in, in the Hindu tradition, I'm not sure where, where women have had tantric sex with snakes. And it was said famously that Philip, her husband, spied this rite through the keyhole and consulted the Delphic Oracle about it, and, and she said, yes, this was a divine conception, and by the way, as a man, you weren't supposed to see it. You're going to lose that eye. And he did lose an eye in battle. So this goes on into Augustus Caesar, who was said to have been born miraculously, miraculously through his mother, uh, Atia, who had sex with Apollo. So the sex with God stories. Europa and Zeus, Daphne and Apollo, Sudinx and Pan, etc., 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 many, many, many. But we also get these stories of these women shape-shifting, turning into reeds or trees in order to avoid the clutches of these male gods. Now, those of us in this room can begin to understand, since we've been talking about fairies, elves, and so forth, as having real ontological existence. If these were women who were transversing the bounds of human divine, human nymph, and so forth, what I believe these stories are talking about, these escape stories that resulted in the woman transforming, were ritual suicides through uh, what we call metamorphosis, what Ovid called metamorphosis, and what others call shape-shifting. They literally tried to become something else or become invisible in order to avoid it, and it cost them their lives, but they would rather have their lives taken than give birth to what? The seed of a patriarchal male god, and then have his warrior hero <coughs> running around the planet and wreaking havoc, which we have in the stories of Theseus, Perseus, and Heracles, all divinely born in this way, usually through rapes, which I contend are talking about rites that were interrupted on the astral plane while exact, precisely while the women were trying to desire themselves in order to become androgynous. All of a sudden, boom, astral entity, not very friendly, coming in and being sexual with them. And we've heard numerous stories in some of our sessions about when people go into altered states, they've ex had rape experiences by various entities. So what I contend is that this is talking about actual situations where these women would get interrupted and would get raped. And their attitude, it, 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 was a, it was a rape seduction that would happen. The women would get disoriented and eventually succumb if they wouldn't shapeshift. So it was a very difficult position for these women to, to be in. What I contend is that eventually, under this pressure, and of course the male priesthood started getting involved and manipulating situations and so forth, under this pressure, I believe that eventually the women started cultivating this practice openly, seeking out the experiences, saying, it's better to have at least a divine male than no div divinity at all coming to the planet, and so it got usurped but that this is a method by which patriarchy entered the planet. Patriarchy in the sense of its hierarchical and out-of-balance elements. Then I find a third phase, which I call priestesshoods of Yeroskamos, or priestesshoods of sacred marriage by surrogate. And these are some of the sacred marriage stories that we might be more familiar with as sacred marriage, where you have a holy woman or priestess, or queen, and a king, or some sort of figure of that nature, pharaoh, who comes, they come together in a ritual sexual union, and conceive, and this is how 
at least in the later period of the Egyptian civilization, we have that the pharaonic line continued itself, which suggests that the entire pharaonic line is thought to come through this method. But in the Egyptian text, the hieroglyphics on one of the temple, it indicates clearly that the king or the present pharaoh entering this ritual was understood to get out of the way and allow the spirit to enter his body, the spirit of Amun in that case, and to have sexual intercourse and that it was the spirit of Amun that impregnated a woman, so it was the god's child. But what I contend is that this is a degeneration of the practice. As they were losing their knowledge about it, as the women were being more and more disempowered, and as the males were trying to figure out how to get these lineages under the male control, because now, prior to this, you wouldn't have any male actor involved, so no sperm was involved, no male could claim the lineage. Now you had a male actor and sperm involved, the male could claim the lineage and ownership of the, this child, and also if the right did not go the way it should have because of degeneration of knowledge or them not quite being in the right state, you could claim that it was a divine king. In the Greek story, I find traditions suggest, or fragments suggestive of this type of practice in several instances. For example, in the story of Alcmene, uh, one of the princesses, which means she was a priestess, who, quote, on the same night had, or no, th this was her story. She had sex with the god Zeus in the likeness of her husband. Amphitryon. What I contend is that stories of that nature are talking about rituals of Yeros Gamos, where her husband Amphitryon and she engaged in a, rit a rite where he embodied Zeus. And the product of this was Heracles. The sign of an ancient belief that women could simultaneously be having physical sex with a human male while actually conceiving the being from another realm. <coughs> For example, we find in this Testament of Reuben, apocryphal type document from the second century of the Common Era, which says, as the watchers continued looking at the women, they were filled with desire for them and perpetrated the act in their minds. Then they were transformed into human males, and while the women were cohabitating with their husbands, they appeared to them. Since the women's minds were filled with lust for these apparitions, they gave birth to giants, for the watchers were disclosed to them as being as high as the heavens. So you have giant entities from the astral realm who get a whiff of the sexual intercourse going on between a man and a woman, they have, as we know, entities have sexual feelings and experiences t directed toward humans. They will come into the mindset of the woman, to the imaginal realm of the woman, while she's having sex, if not physically manifesting in the room. And so that the women are actually having sex with these entities while physically having sex with their husbands. So that's just showing you that, again, floating around, in the ancient world were these beliefs that this could go on. The women had to be virgins in order to do this. Why? Apparently it seems that there was something important about the bio-spiritual condition of virginity that was needed. The intactness of the woman's energetic womb. If it were, was violated in any way by men, that ability would go away. Now, there was also talk of renewal of virginity, which might have been a right that some women were able to do, but we get into complex areas. And I also contend that these women were working deeply in altered states of consciousness, probably with plant medicine. And I talk about some of the stories that, that are indicative uh, of this, that these women are in the, the, the shamanic realms when they're doing it. Also, it seems that there may have been a lesbian element or contingent to these priestesses. A female-female type of love that would be associated with becoming as one ontologically with the goddess. 
in the earliest part of this practice, which is why particularly the goddess Artemis seems to have this lesbian resonance around her with the, with the erotic way that we have the nymphs described in relation to her and also the fact that in order to seduce her key priestess, Callisto, <coughs> Zeus had to appear to her as none other than a female goddess, Artemis. So this is, this is telling us that uh, she wouldn't have been impressed by a male coming in. She would have been impressed by a female coming in. So what was going on there? <coughs> There are lineages of these women, sisterhoods of these women. Uh, there are other aspects. And then finally, the women, through their names, through the names of their children, through the names of their the kings that they would sometimes have sex with, these linguistics would relate to stars. Uh, asterope, asterope. This is suggesting that it was understood that what was happening was a connection with the astral realms, literally the astral realms, the starry realms, that somehow these women were incarnating beings from the stars, and I find particular evidence that they were, there was an understanding of connection with the Pleiades. The Pleiades were a huge asterism of extreme religious importance to the Greeks and at Dodona where the women were called Pleiades the priestesses were called Pleiades or Peleades which is doves which is really the same thing because the Pleiades were considered doves I believe that this is showing us that these oracular centers were connected with divine conception also by virtue of the fact that the womb area and the sixth chakra or the third eye are both the places where conception takes place for the woman. The woman's body is porous to spirit at these two places and the Greeks seem to understand that by virtue of their verb anaireo, which meant to take up, to give an oracle and to conceive in the womb. Like we have, like in English, the word conception means to conceive mentally and to conceive in the womb. The Greeks had that same thing with an added little element here to give an oracle and to take up. I contend that the taking up was referring to the Delphic oracle in particular who would take up the hallucinogenic vapors at Delphi through her womb. And the ancient writers talk about the god coming into her through her genitals and her being perched over the chasm that these fumes would come out of. So we're talking about an understanding of women being receptors for spirit on two dimensions, and that's why the oracular priestesshoods and the divinehood priestesshoods would be one and the same thing, connected in some cases with the stars and the Pleiades. And what I'll mention is that I have developed for the first time a talk on the Pleiades what they meant to the ancient Greeks and what they mean cross-culturally where the stories are remarkably similar about seven sisters who are virgin mothers. And uh, I spoke, I presented this at Glastonbury and I'm going to be presenting it in tomorrow night from 7 to 9.30 in Canterbury, North Canterbury, Wooten, Wooten Village Hall for anyone who's interested. And there are tickets and there, there is a flyer upstairs if you're, if you're interested in coming because I'm going to be tying these two ideas together along with the idea of what does this mean for us today? How does this knowledge propel us forward? Because people are tremendously interested in the Pleiades. Many, many people are. And it is not a New Age phenomenon. It's a very ancient, ancient phenomenon that's completely related to the daimonic world. So where do we need to go from here? What do we need to unveil about this? so that we can move forward. So I will stop here. There's much more that could be said, but I'll stop here for 15 minutes of questions or 10 at this point.